All right, this class is a special seminar that has been directed uh, by the Presbytery uh, concerning the issues of the text and our preference for using the King James Version uh, in public worship. The Free Presbyterian Church, uh, as you are well aware, uh, uses uh, exclusively the King James Version in the place of public worship. That's part of our constitution, part of our directive of worship. And that raises the question, why? Uh, why do we do this? Particularly in a day when there are so many uh, other versions that are available. The King James Version is old, certainly. Uh, the oldest of the English versions that are in current use, uh, many modern versions, and many churches right across uh, evangelicalism uh, and even fundamentalism, uh, whatever that means, uh, are abandoning the King James Version for uh, other modern English translations. So the question then is why? Uh, why do we as Free Presbyterians continue to use the King James Version uh, when so many others are abandoning it. But I did see something interesting. Did you see that article? I think it was in Christianity Today uh, just a month or two ago uh, dealing with the uh, readers of the English Bible. And this was really surprising to me in some ways, but encouraging at the same time. Uh, while the NIV is in some ways the most uh, sales uh, productive right now, top of the list as far as a sale is concerned. 75% uh, of those that actually read the Bible uh, on a regular basis in English uh, are using the King James Version. Uh, really quite a surprising statistic. And this was by Christianity Today, so they had nothing they were trying to prove except uh, to deal with uh, the issue. And that's right across the board. Uh, so that was encouraging. And uh, so we're not by ourselves here. Uh, while the NIV may be leading in sales right now, uh, the King James Version still remains the most popular by a great margin, uh, most popular English version among English uh, readers. So what I want to do here, all right, what I want to do here in answering the question then why as Free Presbyterians we use the King James Version in uh, public worship. Uh, we're going to be dealing with very general things. This class, I think, is titled Textual Criticism, uh, and that's one aspect of it. I want to say some things about textual criticism. I want to say some things about translation philosophy, translation techniques uh, that will have implications uh, to our consideration. We can't be in detail. All right, and I'll just make this clear from the very beginning. What we do in here is going to be on a very surface, uh, on a very surface level. Textual criticism is a very uh, exacting, it's a very tedious uh, process. It's a discipline in and of itself. And we'll set this up where it fits in the whole scheme of biblical studies here in just a little while. Uh, to be a textual critic, you have to have available a great source uh, of material to examine. Uh, we don't have that. You have your various English or Greek testaments, whether it's the majority text or the received text or the uh, critical text that you're using. Uh, and that's what we're relying upon uh, in terms of the notes and the apparatus that they have there. Uh, we are not textual critics. Right? We are not textual critics. It's a separate discipline of biblical studies. We can survey We'll talk about some of the principles of it, some of the techniques of it, some of the philosophies of it. Uh, but there's no way uh, that in a class like this, when I'm not even particularly overly confident in all of the Greek ability uh, that is uh, before me here, uh, to become textual critics. Uh, same thing in regard to translation. Uh, how do we evaluate the nature of translation? Uh, what kind of translation? What are the purposes of translation? And again, in a class like this, we're not going to be able to get into all of the practices of it, but if we can define the terms properly, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, uh, but one of the biggest difficulties that I see in this whole issue, this whole argument, is a ignorance 
uh, in regard even to the terms that we flow around. Uh, technical terms that have a very specialized sense and a very specialized meaning within the field of textual criticism in the field of translation are bandied about with those that don't know what they're talking about and it sounds uh, it, it sounds uh, authoritative at times but anyone who knows the terms and knows the context sees the foolishness I want to avoid foolishness all right I think we can defend our position uh, logically I think we can defend it uh, without going into the extreme uh, views. So let me give some in introductory thoughts here, and then we'll we'll make our way into the uh, individual aspects of the study. Uh, not all advocates, not all advocates of preserving uh, and maintaining the use of the King James Version uh, are extreme. All right. There are some views that you know and I know that you've heard and I've heard uh, that are absolutely uh, extreme. Uh, some are going to claim even that the King James translators were inspired. Uh, they were inspired so that the King James contains a new revelation. Uh, some claiming even, and I've heard it said, I've heard it said by some that you can even correct the Hebrew and the Greek uh, on the basis of uh, the authorized version. Now, that is unorthodox. I want to make it very clear at the beginning, that kind of statement concerning the King James Version is unorthodox. Uh, it reflects an unorthodox view of what inspiration is. We'll talk a little bit here in a moment uh, about the nature of biblical inspiration and the implications of that and the aspects of it. But to argue that the King James Version is inspired in that technical sense of what inspiration is, uh, and that we can correct the original documents, uh, the original text, and that light, I say, reflects an unorthodox view uh, of the doctrine of inspiration. You have others that are King James only. Uh, you've heard that expression, those that are King James only people. Uh, they contend that the King James Version is the translation uh, of the uh, inspired and inerrant text. Uh, they argue that it's the only inspired Bible, and again, I say that's an uh, unorthodox view of inspiration, a misunderstanding of what translation is. Uh, we can hold to the use of the King James Version without being, as it were, King James only and all of the implications that that idea has. Uh, you have those that will argue uh, that it's the Textus Receptus only, uh, that the King James Version is translated from the TR, from the... Uh, Textus Receptus, and I'll give you some things here in a moment that will define these terms for us. Uh, but the Textus Receptus, in a brief statement here, is simply the Greek edition. It was a Greek edition that was used underlying uh, the translation of the King James Version. And some will argue that that's the only authoritative text from which anything can be, uh, can be translated. Uh, I'm not quite as unhappy with that view as the first two, uh, but I think there are some things we need to understand uh, concerning the TR as well. Different degrees of claims even concerning uh, how we understand the Textus Receptus or the Received Text. Uh, some arguments are based on misunderstandings of what the TR is, what the Textus Receptus Received Text is. Uh, and I want to avoid uh, that particular notion as well. Uh, you have some that will argue for the preservation and the maintaining of the King James Version based upon logic, uh, contending that the King James Version is based on the best text tradition and it reflects an accurate translation philosophy. Uh, it maintains and it's based upon an orthodox view of inspiration. Uh, it is a logical assessment of how the text has been preserved. And that's how I'm going to be handling it. All right, I think the way that I'll present this to you is going to be logical. It's going to be based upon an orthodox view, an understanding of what inspiration is and what preservation is. Uh, and if we can understand the logic of how we get from uh, those original Greek manuscripts, Hebrew manuscripts, to the Bible that we have, uh, we can do so in a way that uh, remains within the scope of orthodoxy uh, and... Uh, has some very legitimate reasons, very legitimate reasons for maintaining the use. And that, in a moment, will be the way in which we 
conduct our discussions together. A fifth, uh, a, a fifth reason is just a matter of preference. No particular reason. I just like it. Uh, I, I just like it. Uh, and some will argue on that basis. And I'd rather have those uh, that say, I just like it, uh, rather than uh, using some supposedly spiritual or technical arguments uh, for maintaining it that have no foundation or basis. Now that raises the question also. Uh, how do we deal with those? How do we deal with those that don't agree with us? How do we deal with those that use other versions that don't agree with our particular assessment? And there are various ways that that can be handled. Number one, you can call them names. You can accuse them of having sinister motives. And boy, is this done? All right? Is this done? Uh, those that uh, use another version uh, are apostates. They're liberals. Uh, they are against the truth of God's word, and they're undermining. And you start to question the, the motives. And many of those, and I've heard many arguments against the use of the King James Version that are absolute violators of the Ninth Commandment. Uh, what does the Ninth Commandment prohibit? You ever read the Confession of Faith? shorter catechism, larger catechism particularly, uh, on what is prohibited uh, by the Ninth Commandment, not to bear false witness, yeah. But part of that, part of that, uh, our uh, forefathers uh, instructed us here uh, was to question and to get in and suggest the motives why people were doing something. And I, I, I see this over and over again. Those that will call names to those that use a different version, that are trying to undermine the deity of Christ, undermine breakers of the Ninth Commandment. Uh, let's be very, very careful. There's a better way uh, to deal with those that don't agree with us than just to uh, call them names and accuse them of apostasy and liberalism and uh, trying to undermine the text and whatever else. Uh, easy solution. All right, it's an easy solution. Uh, but I submit that it's not the best way to handle it. Uh, you have others that deal with fear and emotional rhetoric. Uh, they declare, all right, here they declare the King James Version to be the only version. They declare other various versions that are designed to destroy faith, and so the best way to do is just to keep our people in ignorance. All right? Don't let our people... Uh, understand anything, don't let our people see anything. Let's just tell them, all right, tell them uh, these other versions are trying to undermine and uh, the truth of the scripture. Uh, keep them ignorant, you know, keep them ignorant. Uh, that's a Roman Catholic tactic, all right? That's the, that's the tactic of Roman Catholicism, uh, to keep the people in ignorance. There are certain things that our people can't understand, and I've heard this said over and over again, you know, our people can't understand that. Our people can't understand that. They'll undermine. You know, people aren't ignorant, right? And if we use logic and if we use good theology, and we're, faith is never, faith is never afraid of facts, right? Faith is never afraid of facts. Faith is never afraid of evidence. So let's look at the evidence. Let's set aside the scare tactics, the fear tactics, the name calling, and deal with this by looking at the evidence and come to the proper, what I believe to be the proper uh, conclusion. And I will be arguing vehemently uh, for the use of the, and the preservation uh, of the King James Version in our public worship. So the bottom line, using the King James is not a doctrine. It's not a doctrine. I can't find any, uh, any doctrine in God's Word, right, that says use the King James Version. Uh, it's not there. It's not a doctrine. Uh, but I think it is doctrinally defensible, uh, if we define our doctrines uh, properly. So let's start looking at the, uh, at the logic. Some general statements here, first of all, concerning the use of the authorized version, uh, and then we'll get into the issues of textual criticism, particularly the text that is underlying uh, that version. Reasons then for maintaining and preserving uh, the authorized version are both pragmatic uh, and technical. 
Certainly in a day when so much of public worship is defined by the pressures of popular culture, uh, it's imperative, I think, to promote and to maintain in our worship a distinction, a dignity, and a reverence that directs our minds to the majesty and the uniqueness of God. And there is a certain elegance, all right? There is a certain elegance of the authorized version. Not to speak of its translation accuracy, we'll talk about that in due course. But even in the translation, the words and the style, uh, I say there is a certain beauty uh, involved there that contributes to our perception of the Word of God as being that which is matchless, that which is holy, that which is uh, unique. Uh, there are arguments regarding the text that call for its continued use, but the nature of the translation itself and the wording of it, I say from a very pragmatic standpoint, uh, is, I think, a significant reason uh, for continuing and preserving uh, its use. But I want to focus on what I think to be are the solid arguments for that. Uh, I, I can defend the use of the authorized version. I cannot defend much of the rhetoric uh, that is used by some uh, for its continuing use. Uh, as an aid to worship, you know, I, I think it's the best liturgical text uh, that's available to us. When I say liturgical text, I mean a text that contributes to the uh, to, the, to the spirit of worship. Uh, and there's a difference. There's a difference between the place of worship and in a classroom. Right? Uh, in the classroom we can deal with things on a technical level, we can deal with things on a mundane level and examine this and exam but there's a certain spirit that we want to maintain in the place of public worship. Uh, and the very wording, I say, and the very style uh, of the authorized version, the King James Version, contributes uh, to, that, uh, to that beauty uh, of holiness as we worship. Worship is not to be common, uh, is not to be uh, profane. I reject the notion, I do reject the notion that we ought to, uh, because of the archaic words uh, in the King James, uh, set it aside for the use of something that is more, uh, something that is more modern, not quite as uh, arcane as we have in the authorized version. What do we say to that? Are there things that are archaic? Sure there are. I can't deny that there are words that in the authorized version meant something in 1611 in the 17th century uh, that don't mean the same thing now. There are specialized words. Uh, but that's true in any. That's true in any uh, literary setting. That's true in any kind of context. Uh, there are there are words that some of you guys use uh, in your, uh, your your computer stuff, right? You do all of this social media stuff. I, I'm thankful that the Lord has preserved me uh, from getting into social media stuff. All right, but your Facebook stuff and your blogging stuff. Uh, I'm almost tempted to revert to the name-calling approach uh, to deal with those uh, with those issues. They cause trouble, they cause misunderstanding, but let's not get into that. Most people that blog, most people that blog, all right, only do so because they know that nobody will listen to them face to face. But uh, that's that's my opinion. I hate blogs. All right, I'll go ahead and register that I hate blogs. I hate Facebook or MySpace, or whatever you call it, all right? But, there, but there's certain terminology, having got that off my chest, all right, having got that off my chest, there are certain, there's a certain jargon that you people use in that regard, that someone outside of that, we don't understand, all right? We don't understand uh, this, uh, what, what do you call it now, the, the Twittering, or the tweeting, or the... T did you tweet somebody or did you twerk somebody? What, what, I, I don't know what that means. All right? I've never tweeted in my life uh, and have no intent to do so. Uh, but those of you that are involved in that kind of stuff, this friend or that friend, did you post it? Did you, what, what, did you post it? Did you, I forget what I hear. You know what I'm talking about. All, all that stuff, right? I hear that. I don't know what it means. 
But when you're in that context, that jargon is completely understandable to you. And I say, if we same thing with sports, all right? Same thing with sports. How much of sports we we have a certain jargon? There, there's baseball, all right? There's baseball. But there's a common. You know, it's, it's the American game, right? But you get somebody who doesn't know baseball, and you listen to some of the terminology used for baseball. Uh, you know, there's the batter, and he he drew a walk, all right? He drew a walk. You know, what, what, what does that mean? He drew a walk, you know, there, there's work. So here's a batter, he drew a walk, all right? So what, there's, somehow you get a guy walking in that direction. What, what does it mean to draw a walk, you see? But if you know the game, that's a completely understandable. And, and there's a pitcher, all right? There's a pitcher and he's being booed by the crowd. The pitcher's being booed by the crowd because he's throwing balls, right? He's throwing balls. And that's exactly what he's paid to do. Right? He's paid to throw balls, but yet he's booed for throwing balls. Now, we know what that means, if you know baseball. you see. Now, am I going to come to that and say, wait a minute. There's language that baseball uses that is not known uh, universally. So let's repudiate the game and, you know, what? No, of course not. You learn. All right. There is a theological jargon. All right. There is, there is a biblical jargon. But that is, not some, that is not something that is unique to the authorized version. Uh, and, and to this English translation, uh, even in the uh, in the scripture itself, all right. In the scripture itself, we have uh, we we have that issue that uh, is a common language. Yeah, and our confession speaks to the scripture being in the common language, but that does not mean that there's not a uh, for a, 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 a better way of saying it, a jargon. But that was inherent in the scripture itself. You look at you look at the the Old Testament, for instance. All right, you look at the Old Testament. What do you do with that thing? I lost that. What do I do with that? You see what I do with that? Well, no, I'll be. Oh well. Nice thing about this, you can write with your finger. In the Old Testament, right? How how long do we? What was the Old Testament? Did I drop it? This is weird. No. Nope. There it is. All right, Old Testament. How how long was the Old Testament? How how many years for the Old Testament? Moses begins to write when? Fifteenth century. About 1446, let's say, Moses begins to write. For, in 1446, we have scripture, revelation in scripture for the first time, Moses. All right? When did the Old Testament canon come to a close? What's 400s? And we typically, for various reasons, I'm not going to get into all that, we'll date it to 424 for the close of the Old Testament canon. All right, so. We've got a thousand years, all right? There's a thousand years between the beginning of the Old Testament canon and the end of the Old Testament canon. Does language change? All right, Lang as long as language lives, it evolves, all right? Language evolves. It is constantly changing. Various circumstances, various reasons for that, but language changes. And certainly within the time framework in which we have the Old Testament being revealed, inscripturated, there was plenty of time. There was plenty of time for Hebrew to evolve, for changes. But yet when I read the Old Testament scripture, and I read the Hebrew uh, of the 5th century, and I compare that with the Hebrew of the 15th century, there appears to be very little, very little change. There are things then that were established by Moses, and this is the point I want to make here. There was a certain theological jargon, a certain theological jargon that was established by Moses that carried right through. Were there other, and we do know from other 
uh, extra biblical sources that there were changes made uh, in the vernacular Hebrew, in the common language, if you will, of the Hebrew. But there was something about the scripture. All right, there was something about the scripture because of the significant influence that Moses had upon theology that remained constant all the way through that a thousand year period. And even though things may have changed by this time, they were still understood in that biblical sense because of the influence of the scripture. So I say it's not unusual, not unusual. We come to the New Testament. We come to the New Testament. Uh, and there were words that occur in the New Testament. We talk about the New, what kind of Greek in the New Testament? Koine. Call it Koine Greek, right? What does that mean? Say what? Common. common. All right, the common language. Compared to what? We compare it to what? What, what, what was the earlier stage? Yeah, Classic or? Attic, all right? Call, refer to Attic Greek, classical Greek. The la this was the language of literature, what have you. Koine Greek was the language of the common ordinary people. And the scripture, the New Testament, was written in what we know to be the Koine, uh, the Koine style. Not the literary, but understandable. But yet even in the Koine, right, even in the Koine, there were certain aspects of language, certain words that occurred in the New Testament that could not be understood that could not be understood from the typical Koine usage, right? For instance, uh, for instance, you know this word? Let me just get this stuff off here. How come this is not coming off? Uh, hello there. All right. You know this word in Hebrew? Brief? Covenant. Covenant. In the Old Testament, brief was used both for what we call a parity covenant. What do I mean by that? What's a parity covenant? Yeah? Covenant between equals. Between equals. All right? A parity covenant between equals where we can negotiate, huh? You can negotiate, you can... Uh, compromise and you come to some mutually binding uh, agreement between yourselves. All right, a parity covenant. A covenant also, bereath, was used for what we refer to as a suzerainty covenant. What's a suzerainty covenant? One between an inferior and a superior. And in the uh, suzerainty type covenant, sometimes referred to as monopluric, there's no negotiation. The superior sets the terms. The superior sets all of the requirements and right on down the line. But the term bereath was used, and we understand then contextually whether it's parity or whether it's cesarity. You see. Now, come to the New Testament, the Septuagint. Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. What what do you do? All right, what what do you do here with bereath? Now, uh, the Greek had a word. The Greek had a word, suntheke, covenant, agreement. But in its usage, it was always a parity. All right? Suntheke, to place with here, the idea of a covenant, was always a parity covenant. And so if the Septuagint would have translated bereath with suntheke, particularly in the covenant that God has with his people, that would have been completely misunderstood, right? Because God doesn't compromise and God doesn't negotiate. God's covenant is superior to inferior. So we couldn't use this word. So instead, the Septuagint uses this word, diatheke. In Greek usage, diatheke referred to what? You know this word? A last will and testament. A last, not really a clear, concise definition of that. But the Septuagint, the Septuagint used diatheke to represent 
Berith, when it was the monopleric, when it was the suzerainty type covenant. And now then the New Testament, all right, the New Testament, taking now this theology, this, this jargon, taking this jargon that had been established by that translation, yeah, and when we come to the New Testament, we have the word diatheke being used to represent the suzerainty type covenant. But here's my point. If I come to read the New Testament scriptures, simply with the framework, simply with the framework of Greek usage, right? And I see the word diatheke, I'm going to misinterpret it. Because it doesn't refer to a parity. It refers to that monopleric. So here is a term that theologically took on a whole new meaning. Outside of the New Testament, I would never interpret it that way. And those that were coming into the New Testament without the background of the Old Testament, yeah, without the background of the Septuagint data, would and, and they completely misunderstand that. I'm just saying that to say this. Is there a jargon that we have to come to understand? Uh, in, in, in reading the authorized, sure, there is, there is. But that's not something that I say that is unique uh, to the authorized version itself. So, say, same word, another example comes to mind here. Eleos, you know that word in Greek? What's that word in Greek? Eleos. Say what? Mercy, mercy pity. Mercy, pity. Uh, but in the Septuagint, very often... Translates Hesed, right? Elias is not covenant loyalty. Except now, because it translates that Hebrew concept, it assumed, right? It assumed this, this particular concept. And now when I see that word Elias in the New Testament, I have to keep in mind that maybe it's not referring just to pity, uh, but rather this covenant loyalty, right? A jargon. There's a jargon that we have to understand, even, even within the scope of the uh, New Testament scriptures uh, itself. So when I see that occurring then uh, in, in the authorized version, fine, what, what do I ha how do I have to deal with the jargon? I have to know the Bible, right? You read it. And the more familiar it would become with it, and that's what we're trying to do, become familiar with it, uh, these supposed archaic terms I don't think are going to be uh, a real uh, a, a real hindrance to the to the use one of the things that we're doing in this uh, study Bible when you do have these archaic terms you know we're defining them all right here's what it means and very easy to resolve uh, to resolve the issues but my point is it's not a problem that is uniquely associated with the authorized version. There's a theological language, uh, and I don't care what your version is, all right? There are going to be theological terms that unless you know the theology and the background of the circle of knowledge uh, of the scriptures, you're not going to understand whether you're reading the ESV or the King James Version. All right? So it's not, I, I say that, which is impossible to overcome. Uh, one of the, you know, one, one of the big complaints that I often hear uh, about using the, the authorized version is the, is the archaic use of the pronouns, right? You have the archaic use of the pronouns, uh, particularly, you know, particularly the these and the thous. We don't talk that way anymore, right? We don't, right? We don't, and I agree, we don't use thee and thou anymore. But the authorized version does. And some find that to be a bit uh, a bit awkward. But I say in one sense, in one sense the fact that the authorized version retains the use of the these and the thous is a plus. It's a plus. I agree we don't talk that way anymore. These were not particularly, were, and you know you get some are saying, well th this was terms of reverence, all right. They weren't terms of reverence all right, these and thous were not reverential terms when the authorized version uh, was, was, was being written. Uh, 
they, they were just a way of reflecting the singular pronoun. All right? It's a personal pronoun, uh, second person, personal pronoun. And it was a way of reflecting uh, whether that uh, reference was singular or whether it was uh, plural. So, uh, but I say it, it, it's, it's not something that was uh, uniquely tied up with majesty or reverence and respect for someone. Uh, you know, if I were walking down the street and there was a drunk, I would say, thou drunkard you, all right? I wasn't showing him respect. I was just talking to him right to his face, all right? Just to, but that becomes, I say, helpful. Because this, in, in, in every modern version, all right, every modern version, even the New King James, uh, every modern version will succumb here to modern English use and just use you, all right? Now, in modern English, you, second person pronoun, is used for singular or plural, right? Use it for both. You, you, right? Now, there are places, however. There are places in the scripture because Hebrew, Hebrew and Greek both, yeah? Hebrew and Greek both, in regard to the personal pronouns, make a distinction between the singular and the plural. All right. In Greek, there's a difference. You have a singular second person. You had a plural second person. In Hebrew, a singular plural. And in Hebrew, even you, you, you mess with the genders all right, in, in that regard, Greek as well. So, uh, but when I just, no matter gender, no matter, uh, no, no matter number, just use you, I cannot see precisely what the original text is doing. But by maintaining the use of these and the thous and the yees, when I see a thee and a thou in the text, I know that underlying that is a singular. I know that if I see a ye, that it's plural. Now, that may sound awkward in modern English use, and I'm not going to go around talking in this class to these and thous. No. no. But here in this context, as an interpretive aid, as an interpretive aid, this becomes very helpful because there are places in the scripture where knowing whether that's singular or plural affects the, affects the meaning. And in, in most modern, in, in all the other modern English versions, I'm not going to find that unless I get back to the original. I'm not opposed to that, obviously. It's my life. But at the same time, this enables someone who doesn't know Greek, who doesn't know Hebrew, to see the, the grammar that is underlying uh, that particular. I think uh, th you think of the uh, classic example here, right, uh, in, in the Old Testament. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, you have the, uh, the, the virgin birth prophecy. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's this offer of a sign. Ahaz is uh, entering into that ungodly alliance, and God, Isaiah warns him against it, and Isaiah says, uh, ask a sign ask a sign, and a sign that is given specifically, offered specifically uh, to Ahaz in the singular. He rejects that. Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign, all right? Plural, all right? So the sign of the virgin birth that is given is not directed specifically to Ahaz, but is now on a broader spectrum, and that has implications uh, in regard to the interpretation. I can see that in the authorized version. I can't see that in any other English version unless I get to the Greek text, Hebrew text behind it. So I take the these and the thous. I take the these and the thous. Uh, rather than being an obstacle, you know, get over it, but it becomes an aid in study, right? It becomes an aid in study, uh, and there's no other English version that does that. Uh, the use of italicized words, all right? The use of italicized words, I think, is a plus for study purposes uh, in, in the authorized version. Uh, the italicized words mean what? Yeah? Supplied. They're supplied, all right? So they're telling me up front, all right? The translators are telling me when they're doing something that uh, to smooth out the translation, they're doing something to uh, make it more readable or whatever. Uh, but what they are supplying, they are admitting and telling me up front, is not in the text. It's not in the text. Uh, and we can then, you know, go our own way and interpret it differently if we so like in places. 
Uh, they're telling me where they did their interpretation, where they did their smoothing out. Other English versions don't do that. They just flat out give the translation. They do the same thing. All right? Other versions do the same thing. Supply things, add things, rearrange things. Uh, but they don't specify it. They're not up front with it as is the authorized uh, version. So those are pragmatic reasons. All right, those are some very simple pragmatic reasons uh, why I think we have every legitimate reason for maintaining the use uh, of the authorized version. Let me just say a couple things about the technical aspect of it. There are technical reasons as well, uh, and these involve both issues uh, of the text. These involve issues of the text. I don't know why that doesn't work as well as my hand here. The technical issues involving text and involving translation. The text issues, this is going to uh, introduce our whole study here on the issues of textual criticism. All right, What is the text? What is the text that underlies the King James Version? What is the text that underlies some of the other uh, modern versions? And it's going to be my assessment of textual criticism that the text that is underlying uh, the authorized version uh, is more akin to the original text than what we have in the text underlying the other modern versions, ESV, NIV, New American Standard, uh, right on down the line. Uh, I want to put that in proper perspective, all right? I want to put that in proper perspective and see uh, the implications of that, but we're going to talk here about the text, and I'm just introducing at this point that the issues of text will be one of the reasons why I will argue for the uh, use of the King James Version. And then issues of translation philosophy, translation uh, technique. Uh, what do we have to have, what does a translator have to uh, to know, to be able to do, so forth. So that really will define this. We come down to this issue now. This is really going to be where the course is going, all right? Dealing with issues of text and then dealing with the issues of the translation. All right, we'll uh, come back to that.